participation needed and participants to have in here, but um, really when you get the, the right number of people in a cappella singing together, uh, this, uh, this church does have a, a pretty good acoustic to it and uh, sounds kind of good. And I don't know about you, but many times I come in on Wednesday night and my head is still spinning. Uh, just from the things of the week and the things of the day. And so this is an important time for me because that, you know, among the advantages of the Word of God is uh, it can bring you back into focus. It can center you. It can, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that we do today to try and relieve anxieties that we have and come to a position of peace. And, you know, Paul, throughout his epistles, uh, prays for those he's writing to that uh, uh, they would have grace and peace. And I think when you get into the Word of God like we do, then it can have that positive effect of uh, getting our perspective where it should be, putting our focus where it, where it should be at, and uh, just kind of centering us. Because if you can get centered to the things of God, if you can put God in the center, He'll take care of the circumference. Ever push everything else out on the circumference, if you will put your focus on Christ and, and have him in the center, then he will, uh, you know, he'll take care of what's out on the periphery. For those of you who are taking this discipleship too that we're doing for LFBI credit, for credit in our Living Faith Bible Institute, and this is uh, semester number two, and I think we're giving you two credits each semester, but one of, the, uh, one of the things that is due each semester is a book report. Another thing that's due are certain tests that we have at certain times. And so I need to let you know if you're taking this, uh, you know, if you're taking these Wednesday nights with us for a credit in our institute that the that test one for this semester has been uploaded. Um, it will be open to take starting at 6.30 tonight. And um, you'll, you know, just log into my LFBI. You will have 10 days in which to take the test, uh, which should take us out until March 14th. And uh, so I needed to let you know that. Speaking of the uh, assignment also that we have of one book report each semester, um, we, I had assigned the books in the syllabus before Pastor Trotter's latest book on the keys to the Bible came out. And then it came out right at the first of this year. I think we still have maybe a couple of, or three weeks left in the previous semester, and I mentioned this book, and I'll mention it again, um, just to uh, expand grace this way that if you would rather do the book report assignment on this book, instead of the one listed in the syllabus, we'll allow you to do that. We had a grading rubric that will apply uh, whichever book you use. I think for this semester, the recommended book or the required book was Tony Evans' book on um, what matters most, which basically, uh, kind of uh, explains and expounds on the four goals of discipleship, which we use. Uh, but Pastor Trotter's book is uh, more directly related to where we are at right now in discipleship too, which is looking at how to study the Bible. So we had just talked about, um, you know, the fact there are key words and uh, that is chapter 7 of his book and how there is key association, learning by association. And that's chapter 9 of his book. And so a lot of, there's a, a lot of it will be a good uh, overlap. And I'm sure he'll say it much better than I say it anyway. So we encourage you, if you'd like to, uh, uh, to use that book as your book report. As you came in, you should have gotten a handout. Now, actually, it's, it is the same handout as last week. So what we gave you last week is two weeks worth of handout. Let me just get us up to speed on that because we did spend some time last Wednesday night starting off looking at key words and phrases in the Bible. 
And uh, we talked about that in terms of rule number nine that we had given you a Bible study, which is that the individual words of the Bible are the key. And so we started uh, establishing the fact that there are certain key words in Scripture that you should take note of because of the way that they function in the Bible itself and that they will allow you to cross-reference different topics if you understand what those key words are. So we went through the phrase, day of the Lord, and the day of Christ, and um, talked about some differences between those, and then the phrase, those days. And uh, we talked about the t phrase, time of trouble. Um, so various key words, a lot of them having to do with prophecy and, uh, and the end times and God uh, really defining uh, the topic with which we will pick up in our next session, which will be the kingdom of heaven uh, versus the kingdom of God. But we went through, uh, um, you know, examples from scripture of a number of key words and then gave you an addendum that had a list of key words so you could Keep furthering your study in that area. And then, as we ended last week, we began on biblical numerology. So let me pick up with a little bit more detailed review there, uh, in case that uh, you were not here. Uh, we were talking about the significance of numbers in the Bible, and we started off with the number one. And for each of these significant numbers we're going to look at, because, you know, there is numerology that the world use, uses, we're not talking about that. There is a numerology related to divination and things like that. We're not even talking about that. When we say numerology, it is the study of how God uses numbers in the Bible, because as we pointed out to you, uh, um, a lot of the Bible has to do with numbers. And uh, we gave you a specific figure. One out of every five verses in the Bible contains a number that it talks about. And uh, we are all associated by numbers, whether we like math or not. We have a we have a house number, we have a phone number, we have a social security number, we have a driver's license number. Uh, everything is, uh, you know, surrounds us, uh, surrounds us in numbers. And so numbers have significance in the Bible. There is a biblical numerology. We started with the number one. Of all of these numbers, we're going uh, to show you the first mention, place that is first mentioned in the scripture. Because in terms of those rules of Bible study, another one of those rules is uh, the law of first mention. So the first place you see a word or term talked about in the Bible usually defines it, or at least governs how it's going to be used in the rest of Scripture. And so we talked about the number one being associated with unity and stability, and, um, uh, you know, that uh, first mention in Genesis chapter 1, verse 9, and then other places it is mentioned, Deuteronomy talking about one Lord, uh, Adam and Eve uh, united as one, becoming one body the body of Christ as one body. And I think that is where we had left off last time, and where we were talking about the fact that the body of Christ also is one. And uh, this is one of the unities, one of the, so as, as we you have it up on the slide, letter E of what we had gotten to, the body of Christ related to that number one. And in, uh, so here's an interesting thing. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, and at this, at this point, Jesus is going through a series of parables, and he says in Matthew 13, 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened, like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, I'm, and buyeth that field, and it talks about, you know, uh, usually the way that treasure is described is as a pearl, it is a pearl of great price. And um, the significance of it being likened to a pearl, and really the church as the body and bride of Christ being likened to a pearl, or a pearl of great price, is because a pearl can't be split. 
I mean, diamonds and rubies and, uh, you know, other gemstones, you can take and you can split those, but a pearl is actually a living organism, and it's one. You can't, you can't divide it. So that's the number one. Let's move on now to the number two, which is associated with division and separation. Its first mention is Genesis 1, verse 16. Uh, verse 16 says, and God made two great lights, greater light to rule the day, lesser light to rule the night. Oh, by the way, this just kind of ta tagged on as a side thought. Uh, he made the stars also. And God set them, the two great lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So there are in its first mention, two lights, and their job is to divide day from night. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. If you look at that now. So this is kind of Genesis 2, 2, 2. Um, says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Okay, Adam is now divided into two. And now you have from that one essence, man and woman. Two things come out. Um, thirdly, let me give you some other examples of two being used as a number for division. Genesis 10, 25, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. Luke 17, verses 34 to 36, Jesus says, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one taken, the other left. Division. Uh, maybe a more salient example, more significant or clear, the clearest example, uh, probably is Amos chapter 3, verse 3, where he says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? So two people who are not agreed are divided. Now, there are other Things that go along with this in terms of defining the number two from the Bible, biblical numerology. When you see the number two, what type of significance are you able to understand? Well, the major division of the Bible is into two, Old Testament, New Testament. At the second coming, the Mount of Olives splits into two. That's where Jesus comes down. Not... Um, here in Independence, as, as some think, but actually he will come down the Mount of Olives. Um, Matthew chapter 25, the nations, when Jesus comes back, he does a judgment of the nations and they're divided into two, sheep and goats, sheep, goat judgment. Um, you know, one, another further note that I will give, there are many uh, number twos in the scripture and you might just make note of the fact that many times the second of anything is associated with the enemy. I mean, that just happens a lot. So, uh, poor Ahemplo, wherever there is a second epistle in the New Testament, a lot of times it has special reference to addressing something that Satan's doing in some way. Second Corinthians emphasizes the power of the enemy. 2 Thessalonians talks to us about the working of the enemy. 2 Timothy really discusses the ruin of the church in the last times by the enemy. 2 Peter shows us the apostasy caused by the enemy. 2 John gives us the name of the enemy, the Antichrist. So that's the number two. Thirdly, the number three is associated with Trinity, with triunity, with God's power and God's nature and God's image, with unity and union and structure. 
Its first mention is in Genesis 6, verse 10, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And of course, you understand from the rest of that, I mean, in chapter 10 of Genesis, you get an entire table of nations telling us that all the nations that exist came from those three sons. Uh, another example of its usage, now really this is the best example of its usage. And yet, um, if you do not use a King James Version, if you do not use the King James Translation of the Bible, this example is not in there. And this is another instance where in modern versions, this is not the only place I mean, uh, we preached on uh, Sunday, maybe three or four weeks ago, about Acts chapter 8, verse 37, and how that verse is not in the modern translations, but they don't renumber, they just make you think, they just they hope you'll overlook it. So it goes from verse 36 to verse 38, and I hope that you don't notice that you missed verse 37. Uh, this is another example, 1 John 5. Verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these, uh, these three agree in one. So, and I understand, you know, I understand uh, that the, if you are a, if you view, view the Bible skeptically and not believingly, Skeptical scholarship and what is called critical scholarship will say that, well, you know, those verses aren't found in, in most of the manuscripts or the oldest manuscripts or however they may phrase it. And uh, despite the fact that they are found in some manuscripts, um, they'll say, well, they're not in, in almost all the manuscripts and they're not in the oldest manuscripts. And yet, that verse, 1 John 5, 7, has come down to us through the priesthood of believers as existing. So, I mean, either God has been involved in his, with his word to preserve it or he hasn't. If he hasn't, then okay, don't pay attention to 1 John 5, 7. If you view the Bible believingly and understand that the Holy Spirit has watched over the word of God since it was given so that we have today what God wants us to have, then 1 John 5, 7 is probably the most significant example of usage related to this number three. Uh, and it concerns the Trinity of the Godhead because the Trinity of the Godhead, Paul says some significant things we already alluded to in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, whenever we talked about learning by association. Romans 1, 20 says that the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You, you can clearly see invisible things about God by looking at his creation because it is understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they, the lost, the uh, heathen, is without excuse. So the trinity of the Godhead can be understood from looking at the things that God created. Therefore, nature is divided into threes. I think we gave you a previous list in another section. I tried to vary it and uh, add to it this time. I think we get, I'm pretty sure we gave you another chart on your handout this time that talks about sunlight exists in three wavelengths. And that's just what it is. There are three, ultraviolet, visible light, and infrared radiation. Three wavelengths. Time exists as past, present, future. Dimensions, length, breadth, and height. The earth is land, sea, and air. The elements are gas, liquid, or solid. The atoms are protons, neutrons, electrons. Humans are body, soul, and spirit. The family is father, mother, children. Enemies, the three enemies we have are the world, the flesh, and the devil. So you see this trinity of action. You can see uh, the evidence. God leaves his fingerprint in everything he's created. And if the thing about the number three in this respect is if you remove one of the three parts, then that thing ceases to exist. Water has a unique property because if you take water in a lab and put it under the right conditions, then uh, part of it will be liquid, 
Part of it will be gas, and part of it will be frozen, and yet it's all water. Genesis 6, verse 16 talks about a window shalt thou make in the art, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Now, if all you do is view the Bible skeptically, then that, and all you do is limit it to a his, past historical application, then all that says to you is, huh, well, God built, you know, had Noah build an ark big enough that it had three stories. Big deal. Well, it is, it is a bigger deal if you view the Bible believingly and you say, you know, the numbers are significant in the Bible. Really, the three stories in the ark are a picture of the three heavens. I mean, look at it in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. It says, Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. I, now, I think Paul is talking about himself, but he's doing it in the third person. Uh, so he's talking about himself because 14 years prior to when he writes this would have been when he was stoned to death at Lystra. They stoned Paul to death. Now, I'll say they stoned him all the way to death because the way they did stoning was kind of, a, kind of a sure bet you were dead. And yet when everybody from Lystra left and the disciples came around and they're about to gather up his body to bury it, he comes, he comes back alive. So Paul says, okay, you know, there was this guy. Now, I don't know if he was in the body or out. I don't know if I, don't know if I died and went to heaven. Or God just was showing me what was in heaven while I was in that state of being dead. But he says, such an one caught up to, what does he say? 2 Corinthians 12, 2, the third heaven. All right, there are three heavens. The Bible talks specifically about three heavens. So there's a heaven, which is the atmosphere around our earth. There is a second heaven, which is outer space. And then there's the throne of God, and that's the third heaven. I don't know where they ever came up with seven heavens. You know, there was a, you know, used to be a store down on Truce called Seventh Heaven. I, and I, I think that came from Dante's Inferno or something. Or, came, you know, there were, it, somehow he figured out there were seven le levels to hell, so there must be seven heavens. Or maybe, maybe it's Catholic superstition that there are seven heavens. But the Bible says no. There are three heavens. And that's, that's also talked about, Psalm 148. So, okay, if there are three levels in the ark, automatically you got a picture of the three heavens in the universe. And as far as that goes, the temple in the Old Testament was a, is a picture of the universe. So that you have the holy of holies, where the ark of God is at, that's his throne. You know, isn't it interesting that when the priest goes in and sprinkles blood... The top of that ark is called, the, is called what? The mercy seat. Because it's picturing the throne of God. They had a mercy seat in the Old Testament. We have a throne of grace we approach in the New Testament. And so, okay, that's one, that was one section. And then there, was a, then there was a holy place. And then there was the outer court and, and those that is a picture also of the three heavens and the three parts of the universe. Other examples of, you know, this type of uh, usage of the number three, the proper full title is Lord Jesus Christ. That's three. The reason that the lost need to be saved is they only have two living parts. The, their body and their soul, that... Their spirit is dead until they are born again. They only have two living parts. That is why death for them is real death. We don't see death. We're just translated because we're born again. So we have a living spirit, living soul, you know, body that's brought back from the grave, living. They, uh, you know, they will also be resurrected, but to a resurrection, not of the just, but of damnation because they only have two living parts. That's why they need to be saved. Now, for whatever it's worth, now, 
Back when I went to school, there were, so this is Fred Flintstone days. How many of you in here, when you went to school, there were nine planets in our solar system? Raise your hand. Huh. So at, at that time when the scientists said there were nine planets, there were nine planets, and they were actually in three groups, rocky planets, gas giants, and ice giants. Now, since, you, since the day that you and I went to school, now this may be new information to you, but the International Astronomical Union downgraded the status of Pluto to a dwarf planet because it did not meet all three of the criteria to define a full-size planet, and Pluto meets all the criteria except one, it has not cleared its neighboring region of other objects. So I don't know, are there eight planets, are there nine? Well, there were nine and then there were eight, and now the latest thing is, you know what, they say there's a giant planet out there we just haven't been able to see yet, and it's the ninth one. I, you know, I don't know. There, I, I, think there's, I think there are probably nine in groups of three. But that, you can take or leave that for whatever it's worth. Next, the number four is associated with the earth and with creation. Its first mention is Genesis 2, verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and came into four heads. That's Genesis 2.10. So the one river fed four, became the head of four rivers that came out of Eden itself. Uh, some other examples of usage that we will give you, starting with Daniel chapter 7 verse 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and beheld the four winds of the heavens drove upon the great sea. Four winds. So that's also associated with the earth, Revelation 7.1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Because that's how we talk about it. Because there's north, south, east, and west. Holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Creation of planet earth was finished on the fourth day of creation. So it seems like the number four is kind of associated with our planet, with the earth, with creation. Number five is associated with two things. And I think we have to keep both these things in our mind when we consider the way the number five is used in scripture, because it's kind of like two sides to the same coin. And, it, and it's an interesting thing that... Um, it, it takes one to overcome the other because it's associated with goodness and severity. It's associated with grace and also with death. So it's associated with death unless there's grace. Um, first life appeared on the fifth day. Genesis 1, 20, verses 21. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. The fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. God saw, saw that it was good. That was on the fifth day. You say, well, Alan, that is, that's the word fifth. It's not the word five. Okay. First mention, uh, first mention, look at Genesis 5.5. 5. So, okay, this is another interesting one. Five, five, first mentions somebody dying. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died in Genesis 5, verse 5. That is paralleled by the fact that someone dies in Acts chapter 5, verse 5, which happens to be the fifth book of the New Testament. Acts chapter 5, verse 5, Ananias Hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Acts chapter 5, verse 5. In the Old Testament, there are several men, it is recorded, of them being smote under the fifth rib and died. 2 Samuel 2, 23. 
Howbeit he, uh, he refused to turn aside, wherefore Abner with the hinder end of the smear smote him under the fifth rib. And we won't go into the details what happened after that, but he died. Uh, 2 Samuel 3.27, when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. A turnabout was fair play, I guess, in that case. 2 Samuel 4, 6, And they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat, and they smote him under the fifth rib. 2 Samuel 20, verse 10, But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him therewith in the fifth rib. Its first mention of actually the word five is Genesis 14, verses 8 and 9. There went out the king of Sodom, that's one, the king of Gomorrah, two, the king of Adma, three, the king of Zeboim, four, the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, five, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim, with Kertolomer, the king of Elam, with Tidal, king of nations, with Amraphel, king of Shinar, with Ariok, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. Uh, and it, and it, let me give you an example of its dual usage, covering both grace and death. One example from the Old Testament, one from the New. Genesis 43, verse 34. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him. But Benjamin's mess, so now this is Joseph, and his brethren have come down to Egypt to, to try and buy wheat and grain because of the famine that was in the earth. And, and he made them bring back his blood brother, the youngest one of them, Benjamin. And uh, Joseph is still acting like he's an Egyptian, so he hasn't revealed himself to them yet, but he's feeding them. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him. So he sat down with his food. And then he tells his servants, well, Take this brother that, and this brother that, and this brother that. And Benjamin's mess, his meal, was five times so much as any of theirs. That's grace. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four, Of the Jews, Paul says, five times received I. Forty stripes save one. Thirty-nine lashes. That's not grace. So there's dual usage to the number five. There are five Levitical offerings where sacrifices, grace, are killed, death. There is a five-fold edification ministry of the church, talked about in Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Jesus five letters, for whatever that's worth, came to die. He had five wounds in his body, both his hands, both his feet, and a spear in his side, probably penetrating under the fifth rib. So that's number five. Number six is associated with man and every Lady in here, every woman among us will understand, therefore, that is also associated with imperfection. If it's going to be associated with man, it's also going to be imperfection. So, Genesis, uh, first mentioned Genesis 30, verse 20, and Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons, six men. Now, it turns out they weren't the best men, but six men. Um, Adam is created, man is created on the sixth day in Genesis 1, verses 26 to 31. That's all on the sixth day. Another example of usage, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. And Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, that's 60 and the breadth thereof, six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Huh. So, so Nebuchadnezzar made a gold man. A, a gold statue of a man. And it was 
60 cubits high, that's roughly speaking 90 feet tall. And 12 feet, um, 9 feet wide. I guess kind of a skinny man. But he set it up and everybody had to bow down and worship it. Uh, the Old Testament work week was six days. Also, as you consider biblical numerology, more or less, a picture of, of the more or less 6,000 years of human history, 6,000 years of man's dominion over the earth. Luke 13, verse 14 says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, and he said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed. Not on the Sabbath day. Like as if healing was any type of work for God. But, you know, with some people it doesn't have to make sense. Uh, Revelation 13, 18. Final example we'll give. The mark of the beast. Uh, Revelation 13, 18, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man. And this man's number is 600, three score, 60, and six. Six, six, six. It is specifically said to be the number of a man, and it is the mark of the beast. So that's the number six. Then there is the number seven, which is associated with perfection and completion. So whatever man couldn't do, where man always falls at least one level short, God goes all the way. Uh, so this is, I'll say, the most important and pr probably more profound number of all the numbers in the Bible. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, earth is created in six days. In Genesis 2, on the seventh day, God rested. And again, that pictures the roughly more or less 7,000 years of human history. If you consider Adam was created, we will say, 4,000 years before the coming of Christ. We have been 2,000 years since the coming of Christ. After Christ comes, there will be a millennial reign of Christ. So four, five, six, seven. So, uh, um, and then, every, then God's done proving everything he needs to prove in seven dispensations. Um, so, so this is a significant number. It's first mentioned is Genesis 4, verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever say it slayeth Cain... Vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now you can see how Satan perverts that, turns it on its head, does it exactly the opposite. Uh, takes the ables of the world, as let, let's say, the Antichrist takes, you know, hunting down Jewish saints in the tribulation, tribulation saints, wanting a mark to be set upon them so that they suffer an eternal death. And all it is is a mockery of what God did in Genesis 4. You know, I think about that type of thing every time, uh, you know, I'm reminded of my dad. My dad was uh, a Freemason. And in Masonry, Freemasonry basically was set up in the Enlightenment uh, age, uh, you know, in the 17s and then 1800s. Masonry was, Freemasonry was set up not originally as a philanthropic organization, which mostly it is today, but actually it was set up to mock organized religion. And so in Freemasonry, you had a combination of Jewish and Egyptian and other names run all together as being a sacred name, and, and you had an altar, and you had, you know, all the secret things that they did behind closed doors after you were initiated. Uh, some of that involved an altar and maybe a Bible, uh, and you had to have a belief in, quote, God. Okay, that's, that's no different than the, the ancient Romans. 
And uh, so, you know, so there's, there's all that, but really most of it was simply a mockery of what you find in the Word of God. And men who were coming together in the Enlightenment age says, let's find a way to create our own club. And let's make it a mockery of what we came out of. And uh, that's, they, they kind of learned that uh, from uh, what, what Satan has done uh, in mocking the things that God does. Another example of usage, Genesis chapter 41 Verses 29 and 30, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. Revelation 10, verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. <coughs> So the book of Revelation, let me just say this about the book of Revelation, you might make note of this, it's filled with sevens. The, wor- the, number, the word seven is used 54 times in the book of Revelation. There are seven churches, seven spirits, seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven angels, seven seals, seven horns, Seven eyes in those horns, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven heads, seven plagues, seven vials, seven blessings, seven mountains, seven persons, persons, seven kings, seven warnings, seven new things, and seven woes. And something else I, you know, I probably forgot to list. So Revelation is the culminating book of the Bible that gets us back to the original plan God had is just filled with sevens. Leviticus chapter 23, sevens complete the layout of the Jewish feasts. Leviticus 24 verse 7 says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. Okay, the Feast of Trumpets is a picture of the second coming of Christ. Because that's what we just read in Revelation 10. Seventh angel is going to sound a trumpet. The, the trumpet is sounding to alert God's people that there are armies being assembled for war. And in this case, it's going to be us and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're coming back and... There's a seventh angel with a seventh trumpet, and the seventh, seventh trumpet is going to sound. And so now you have this seventh feast, and it's a feast of trumpets, and it occurs in the seventh month, which is basically October-ish, uh, according to the lunar calendar that they used. Uh, the book of Revelation completes Scripture. Revelation 22 is like complete circle back to Genesis 1 and 2, and full of those sevens that are stirring there. Uh, maybe one of the last things that we'll mention to you, but yet uh, I think it is uh, you know, significant for you to note, there are actually, if, if you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, there are seven earths in three categories. So the Bible talks about seven earths. Now, uh, you ought to pay attention. Some of this will be significant this next Sunday as we uh, continue to dip into Hebrews chapter 11 together. And uh, while I've, you know, I preached through a lot of the Bible and I preached a lot of books expositorily and I preached through a lot of, and even if when I don't preach, when we're not going through a book in expository fashion, if I take up a topic, I try and find a passage that speaks to it that will go through expositorily. <clears throat> and um, years and years ago, I think I did preach through Hebrews chapter 11, but it, it feels to me like um, I'm not preaching Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is preaching me um, these Sundays as we go through it together. And that's, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a unique, interesting, and odd thing. So I don't know what that means. I just... I just think God's doing something, but you might take note because this Sunday we're going to be looking at exactly one verse out of Hebrews chapter 11. It'll have somewhat to do with this and also with uh, the Ark and Noah and stuff that we looked at before, 
but there's seven earths here, 2 Peter 3, verses 6 and 7, whereby the world that then was, okay, well, that's one earth, was overflowed with water, uh, over, being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now, that's a second category of earths, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And then we know there's going to be a new heaven and earth, new earth. So you've got the earths of old, the one that was created, Genesis 1.1, then voided and replenished and created in Genesis 1.2. So there's two earths. You've got the earths which are now the one that was recreated, Genesis 1.10, the one that was flooded, Genesis 7 and 8, the present one, and then the millennial earth, Genesis Revelation 20, when the earth is regenerated, Jesus says, and then finally you've got the new earth, new heavens and new earth and eternity, Revelation 21 and Isaiah 66, 7. So just to further note, the idea of completion is, is reinforced by the fact that there are seven primary colors. There are seven notes in a musical scale. There are seven days in a week. And there just are. And um, so, that's the number seven. Number eight is associated with newness and resurrection and regeneration and new beginnings. Its first mention is Genesis 17, verse 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. So any male child born within your household is to be circumcised on the eighth day. Now, uh, we don't have the verses listed here, but you know, in Colossians it does talk about the spiritual circumcision. So, so circumcision in the New Testament is that circumcision of your heart. It's what happens to you at new birth. It's being born again. And physical circumcision in the Old Testament was simply a Bible type or picture of being born again and becoming that new creature in Christ. So it was done on the eighth day after birth. Now I know I don't know if you've ever considered this or not. I've you know I've had people approach me in the past and they were you know kind of upset with whole idea of circumcision. Like, you know, why would God even do that? And isn't that really cruel? I mean, isn't that just child cruelty and you know, yada 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 yada. And on and on with that. Uh, while there, uh, uh, for you know, whatever it is worth, I think uh, the reason that pediatricians are even willing to do it is there are some benefits to that. But besides that fact, it, it might interest you to know um, vitamin K is necessary for blood clotting, and vitamin K peaks in the infant's system on the eighth day after birth. Now that's just really interesting. Another example of usage, Leviticus 23, verse 36, seven days shall ye offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord on the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly and ye shall do no servile work therein. It's kind of turning over a new leaf. It's a new day. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells about how God spared not the old world, meaning that pre-flood world, that pre-flood earth, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Genesis 6, verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, 1 Peter 3, verse 10, 20, still talking about this event in general, 1 Peter 3, verse 20, uh, talking about those who were sometime disobedient, 
when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. They were saved by being in the ark when it was going through the water. And uh, so eight people were saved in the flood. And then there was a new beginning of humanity on the earth. Uh, human history runs, let us say in round figures, 7,000 years. So 4,000 years Old Testament, 2,000 years New Testament, and then 1,000 years for the millennium. And then there is a new heavens and a new earth, a new beginning uh, in the eighth millennium after that. Um, so the universe itself resets after the seven dispensations that we talk about in, uh, that we will talk about uh, somewhat in this course, but also we have a whole separate course on dispensational theology. So resets into eight. Number nine is associated with fruitfulness and the Holy Spirit. First mention is in Numbers 29, verse 26. And on the fifth day, nine bullocks, two rams.